Sahana Vavatu, Sahana Bhunaktu, Sahavir Yankarawa Wahai, Tejasvina Vadhita Mastu, Ma Vidvisha Wahai. Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Last week we've done verse 13, 16, and 17 last week. And that was the essence of Jnana Yoga. So without moving forward to verse 18, uh, we need to revise what we have done so far because it is an important section and it is a prominent section of chapter 18, this verse uh, 16 and 17 especially. But let's start with verse 15. So verse 15, we have talked about that the individual, the individual called the jiva, is uh, consisting of five factors in total. So we got daiva. This is the external factors, but also the um, your habits, your samskaras. We got the karana. The karana is the internal instrument, the inner instrument. So that is the instrument of the mind, the buddhi, the manas, the chitta. Uh, adhishtana, Krishna called the physical body, adhishtana, is the substratum that hosts all of these five. The cheshta, which is the prana, that is uh, governing the different uh, physiological functions. And we've got the karta or the hamkara, which is the, also equated to the buddhi. That means the agent which is able to move this entire instrument around. And then we said that this entire instrument, because of these five factors, what happens? What's the consequence? Action. And what kind of action does get produced in the world? Either of the physical, either of thinking, or either of speech. Manasam, vachikam, and kaikam, physical. So all these three actions get produced in the world because of these five being there. When the actions get produced, what's the consequence of that? The consequence is punya papa mixture. In other words, we either make a mistake or we do something good and therefore we get rewarded or we get punished. Whether immediately or in the future, either way, it is still a punya papa mixture. And this punya papa mixture thus sculpts the jiva's destiny, in other words, one's life. So we ask ourselves, what is the, that determines one person's life over the other? If we had two people, why is one person's life successful and one person's life is relatively unsuccessful and they're still struggling, they're still finding the ways? And then we can trace that back. Well, because of punya papa, and that is traced back to the kinds of action and that is traced back to these five being there. And then these five were put in verse 15 in a category called anatma. And this is how we start with the inquiry process. We have to ask what is anatma? And we said, we gave several definitions, but the prominent ones was anything that changes, that modifies, anything that is a change in intensity or a quantity or a quality, uh, anything that uh, happens in life, anything that is experienced, anything that is reported, anything that can be known by the individual, anything that can be known whatsoever. So this means no matter how subtle or how gross, it is still known, nevertheless, it is still an experience. So therefore, by this, we can start to now inquire, then who am I? If I am I'm neither things that I can report, that means I must be something other than what can be reported, which is the category of anatma. Okay. And that was verse 15. And then verse 16, we moved on and we asked the question and we said, without defining what is Atma yet, we said, why is it that the Jiva does not know about that? Why is it the Jiva misses the obvious? And we gave several reasons. Jiva Srishti is a very important concept to understand because everyone falls for Jiva Srishti. What is Jiva Srishti? Jiva Srishti is the little voice, the little narrative that always wants to, uh, has this narrative of should, you know, this should happen or this shouldn't happen. And it happens to all of us. I'll give an example because the person that we know most is who? Yourself. So I'll give you one example of my own. So some time ago, as someone asked me uh, a question by email, and I always reply to the email. And I asked a lot of, they had a lot of different questions. So I was very careful and took my time to answer each one of them, like little line by line. 
And I sent this email to them, replied. And I got a reply 10 minutes later. And I was taken back by that immediately. I thought, wait a minute, how can he reply with a new question? He hasn't even considered all of my you know, well-structured, well-formed answers. And I didn't read his second question, which was totally unrelated to his first question. So then I sat down and I was just with this agitation. I was like, why do I feel agitated if I've done my duty by answering the question? You know that feeling where it's just there and you don't know why it's there, but it's there. So what I do, I sit, and always this is my default method. I sit down for meditation, close my eyes, first calm the mind down, be with that pain, feel that pang, that pang of, uh, of emotion, of agitation. And then I started to ask, what would I have to, how would I have to interpret this in order for this feeling to arise? How would I have to look at this in such a way that something so innocent would produce this form of agitation in my mind? What would I have to believe in order for me to experience this pain or agitation or frustration right now? And then I started to inquire. Now notice, I did not discard it as anatma. So there is a time and place when you say atma, anatma, and there's a time and place where you put that aside and you go back down to therapy, ordinary therapy methods. And I said, ah, I understood why. Because I had an expectation. I took my time and I value my time and I value my answers. They are qualified and they are informed answers. And he did not see that. So therefore, it was about whom? It was about the individual. I was making it about myself. In other words, there was an expectation. You're supposed to consider this. You're supposed to reply much later. You're supposed to reply according to what I said, not according to your new answer. So it was all about the individual. Therefore, ah, okay. And you can feel that intensity from 10, drop, 9, 8, and just go whoosh, 4, and then 0. And it's quite an amazing feeling. What happens? And it's empowering, isn't it? When you take a moment and you work it out by yourself and you see it was, I was making it a personal interpretation, Jiva Srishti. You resolve it and immediately that pain falls down. So this is what we call falling innocently for these little interpretations, these shuddhisms, shoulds and shuddhisms. And therefore they cloud our vision and are you, question for you, are you interested in Atma, Anatma, Viveka when there is a basic emotion of agitation or disruption in your mind? Are you interested? Are you thinking about self-knowledge? No. We can't get it out, right? We can't get, we can't get this thing out. Therefore, put Atma, Anatma aside, work it out according to inquiry. Work out the source. And the answer is, it's always the interpretation of your own doing. Therefore, reinterpreted. Therefore, what is Jiva Srishti coming back to the point? I'm overlaying what is. What is? He replied 10 minutes. That is what is. That is what has happened. And therefore, Jiva Srishti overlays that or what should happen. And immediately that pain comes. So question is, or statement is, the proportion or the gap between how aligned you are with Ishwara, that the farther that gap is, the more pain is felt. The closer that gap, that means you are with what is, that pain is no more. That pain simply leaves. This is a very important concept. Why am I saying this? Because without the obvious, inquiry becomes very hard. The second reason that we stated why the jiva does not know this, number one, being preoccupied with their own narratives, is because the mind is gross. In other words, this mind is still thinking about matters like the bicycle and um, just basic family affairs and so on, which is understandable, as I said. And the mind thinking gross for such a long time, it is used to thinking gross. Therefore, it simply doesn't think about subtler matters. And we can observe this. As I said last week, the farther we go into the subtler matters like space, what happens? The mind goes into outer space. Now, if the mind goes, cause the element of space, outer space, then what do you think is going to happen when we introduce and we say the word God? It's going to go really out there. In other words, no wonder people have this innocent association between God, which is the subtlest of the subtlest, and Vaikuntha, Svarga, heaven is always out there. 
Therefore, we can see how the subtlety of the mind is required for this knowledge to come true. At the same time, we can understand why we have churches, temples, mocks, synagogues, and idols, and so on. Because the gross mind only relates to what? Gross objects. Therefore, we have to give it what the mind relates with. By this, we can see that there is a purpose for these uh, idols out there. And therefore, there's no need to criticize. Now we can see why they're there. The moment your mind gets more subtle, there is a natural disinterest. It doesn't have to be. There's a more of a disinterest, a more objectivity towards idols, towards uh, statues and so on. Okay. So these two reasons were given. And then in verse 17, we stated the next question, having now answered what is anatma, what is atma? That is what's left. And we stated first, atma is, that means who am I? What is my true nature? It is the ever-present ever available, I am ever present, ever same presence that I am at all periods of time. That means that which is most familiar all the time. What is most familiar? Most familiar. No, even more familiar than that. You, that means you are always most familiar. Just like when we say the word Upanishad, that means that which is closest, that which is nearest. If I ask you the question, what is the nearest of the nearest to you? The nearest of the nearest. Is it the screen that you're seeing now? Is it your eyes? Or is it you? Now, if I ask the question, where is the locus of you? When you say I, existence, where is that center when you say I? Can you pinpoint it? No, it's more like diffused all over the place, diffused over the body, which is really interesting. What if your body was much bigger? That means it would still be diffused throughout the body. What if your body was the size of the entire universe? We call that Virat. That's Ishwara's physical body. It would still be the same answer. It is everywhere. Therefore, the only difference between Ishwara's physical body called Virat, that means all physical bodies, and a small physical body, that means microcosmic, is the size. But it is still pervaded by that which is most familiar, most available, ever available, ever familiar presence, which is self, the Kevalam Atman of self. The second definition is actionless. Actionless, what does this mean? It means that the, uh, the self has no capacity to do, has no capacity to enjoy, nor capacity to suffer anything. However, in association with the Buddhi, it seems as if I have the capacity to do, to enjoy, and to suffer. Therefore, we say, I do, I enjoy, I suffer. Owing to that linking point of the association with the five sheets. Okay, so these two have been stated further. And then we said, once we first understood what is anatma and atma, only then we can move on to the second step and we can say, okay, having known, having concluded, what these two are, now I can make two further conclusions. And what are these two conclusions? First is, there is nothing that can be done about these five, because they are not yours. They are governed by the total, by the total intelligence, Ishwara. And they are doing according to what? According to the nature of the individual. And that nature, what is this nature? This will be expounded in verse. 20 to 40, which is coming up. Uh, otherwise, in simplicity, what is the nature of the individual? All of your samskaras and what makes you individual of uh, your past actions. That means your life, your narrative. So there's nothing you can do about this uh, impersonal mechanism that is part of this world. The second conclusion you say is, okay, so having known that I cannot do anything about this, then once again, who am I? I am the ever familiar, ever present principle of knowledge in whose presence knowledge of these five comes to be, comes to be known for what it is. In other words, who am I? I am the ever-present, ever-familiar presence in whose presence knowledge of these five comes to be known. What do I mean by knowledge? That means anything that it arises in any of these five, and whether we're talking about the inner world or the outer world, it doesn't really matter because this is changing. The mind's always changing according to the outer world. So it's one and the same. It's the world. It's just the world. So 
I'm that in whose presence the world comes to be what it is. That means knowledge takes place in whom? In whom does knowledge take place? In you. In other words, this is an important concept. You are not because of this. You are because of you. The mistake that we make is we think I know myself because of these five. I know that I am because I have a body mind. No, right now, you know that you are not because of these five. You know that you are because of what? Because of you. Because the self is self-validating. It needs no validation from the body. In fact, the body sensations need you for them to come into their presence, for them to come into their being and therefore be verified as that, as that distinct attribute. So these two conclusions get made. And then we um, said, which was instigated by Mina, a good comment, was about the word doership. Now, what is releasing doership? Releasing doership means letting go of the notion that I am a doer. How does this notion get released? What we call discernment between that which comes to knowledge and that in whose presence this comes to knowledge. And in whose presence does this come to knowledge? You, in your presence. It doesn't come into your partner's presence. It comes in your presence. In other words, you're constantly making that distinction. And this distinction initially is called paroksha jnanam. What is paroksha jnanam? It is cognitive process. It is a deliberate process, a process that happens in the mind, in the buddhi, that constantly makes this distinction between that which is ever familiar, ever present, and that which is constantly coming in presence because of my presence. And this paroksha jnanam initially starts as this mindful process. Slowly, slowly, like anything, it becomes an automatic process, just like driving a car. You drive a car and then immediately after some time, you just let it go and it's automatic, spontaneous. So yes, it is an intellectual process at the beginning, but through the course of time, it releases from the need to constantly make a discernment and becomes an effortless, spontaneous discernment. And therefore, you can just let go of this idea. Going back to verse 15, what is in here? sensations, limitations. So whenever we feel pain, what are we identifying with? What, is, what am I identifying with whenever we feel any kind of pain? We're identifying with that which is inherently limited. Therefore, what is paroksha jnanam at the beginning? It is making a distinction between anatma, the source of pain, and atma, the source of contentment and joy. Now, I want to ask you, are you, do you want pain? Put your hand up if you want pain. So that tells, that proves inherently, you know, you cannot be that because you cannot say I want it unless you are that. But watch what happens now. Do you want contentment and joy? Yeah, we all want contentment and joy. So this is inherently revealing to us that which we already identify with. Therefore, you don't have to call it atma anatma or self and not self. You can just say I am discerning between what? Pain and contentment or joy. Pain is illusion. Joy is the reality. Pain is sleep. Joy is awakening. Pain is falsehood. Joy is the truth. So we are constantly, deliberately making a choice through our free will. Is it between pain or is it between contentment and joy? Again, going back to verse 16, you have to be careful. It's not just about discarding. You have to sometimes just Put this aside and deal with the matters, jiva srishti. So you have to make this decision on your own. Let's make a little analysis about our experience. Right now, there's two experiences that are going on in this very moment. Take a breath. Okay, now let's see what these two experiences are. The first I am, you. There is the experience of the ever-familiar, ever-present, I. We call this unmodified existence awareness, satchit. Why do I call existence awareness, kevalam atmanam, the self? Because you cannot deny that you exist, that you are, and that you are conscious or that you are aware. Therefore, unmodified existence awareness, I am right now. Can someone deny this? 
If you do deny it, you're in contradiction because you exist and you're aware to listen to this question. The second experience that is happening this very moment is, this is called self-inquiry, by the way, is that which is unfamiliar. Is this moment familiar to you or is it a brand new moment? Have you lived this moment before? over and over in the exact same way, in the exact same movements, making the same words, same feelings, same emotions, having the same thoughts. Has this ever happened before? Or this is a brand new moment? It is a brand new moment. So number one, there is the familiar. And number two, there is the unfamiliar. In other words, there is the new, there is the modifying, there is the changing. And this changing, we call those five layers or we call it jagat the world there's no difference between this or the world this just changes the mind changes according to how the world changes in other words the world changes the world changes the world changes it's one and the same and what is the nature of the second it is also unmodified existence awareness satchit obtaining in the power of maya's triguna shakti making it as though it is modifying so what is common between these two they are both one and the same reality such existence awareness kevalam atmanam one is that because of which i can observe the second and what is the second what is the second order of reality, which is still part of the one reality, which is still the one reality? It is same reality, same unmodified existence awareness, obtaining in Maya Striguna Shakti, which is making it as though it is modifying into this experience, into this world, into your body right now. What's the conclusion? It is one reality. Two orders of the one reality. The familiar order of the one reality, the unfamiliar order of the one reality. Why is it the unfamiliar? It's not that it's a different reality. It is unfamiliar by the Maya Triguna Shakti, which is modifying it according to the Trigunas, which makes it as if it is constantly shifting and changing and going left and right. But it is the one same Satchit order of reality. When is this happening? When is it not happening? It is a constant experience that cannot be denied, no matter where you go. So this is the process of self-inquiry. Now, what is the logic for this? The logic is very simple. Only in reference to the unmodified can you report the modified. Only in reference to the familiar can you report the unfamiliar, just like being a train. Only in reference to the unmodified environment, the still environment, I can tell that the train is moving forward. Finally, let's apply this to our own thoughts. Because what is our life made of? Thoughts. When a class ends, you'll be thinking, what should I do tomorrow? What should I do today? I'm hungry right now. This is a whole thought. This entire class right now is nothing but a thought. Okay, so let's look into our thoughts because that is all we have for our entire lives. So you look into your thoughts right now. What is a thought? It is nothing but modified existence awareness. The next question comes is, how do you prove that my thoughts are existence awareness? The answer is, because my thought exists. And number two, because I am aware of each thought. Therefore, what is the content of all your thoughts, all emotions throughout the entire life? It is existence awareness apparently modified through maya's three guna shakti therefore you're only ever dealing with the one reality and there is these two orders of this one reality that one called the nyani is constantly alert to and never loses track of atma anatma puts it in the right place that's all moksha means having things in the right place the focus is in the right place not losing track. Okay, so it is a moment. It is a moment. Let's deal with it. Let's deal with the Jiva Srishti. Or if it's not so bad, if it's not so intense, then you go one step forward, one step higher, Brahma Vidya, and you go, okay, so this is the same reality such it, but it is modifying. It may not be a pleasant modification, but it is nevertheless the one same reality. Okay, so this is the essence of what we call 
Brahma Vidya or Atmanyanam or self-knowledge. As you can see, it is a order. There's no skipping. There's no going zigzags. It is step by step and it is for you to apply. Okay, so final conclusion. What is the content of each thought? Suppose I ask you right now, okay, Lorena, what is the content of each thought? My perception of what you're discussing. Okay. And, and that entire experience that my perception of what you're discussing was nothing but a modification of satchit. In other words, this is what the jnani is, or jnanini is constantly keeping in mind. Everything that happens, category number two. Because it's happening, because it's coming to knowledge, category number one. It's interesting because the teaching of the data and a lot of your teaching earlier stresses the importance of distinguishing between satya and mitya, atma and anatma. And this is why the teaching about orders of reality is important, but ultimately everything is satya and everything is atma. Those distinctions themselves yes. is another part of the universal party superposition. Good. So Wonderful. So Robert is putting a very good point. So the ultimate understanding, and this is something that Robert reminded me, one step before moksha, what is one step before moksha? Atma anatma viveka. There's still a need to discern that from this, the unfamiliar from the familiar. When the understanding is full, it is effortless. But why is it effortless? That's the question. Because the understanding is, no matter what, I, whatever I discern, it's still the same one reality. Therefore, why should I discern in the first place? What? Why should the wave, which is nothing but the water, discern other ways, which are also the water, when it's only water? Therefore, there's only Atma, but this Atma, owing to Maya Zupadi, has an apparently a different order of reality, has a different order of reality, which we then attribute, which we call Mitya or Anatma, but it is the one same reality that you're ever dealing with. That means you cannot be away from what is already the absolute truth this very second. Having a hard time, you're still that. Having an easy time, you're still that. This is the final understanding. And therefore, owing to this understanding, there is no need to perform a deliberate atma anatma viveka. And this is what we call aparoksha jnana or moksha. So it's an understanding. There's a practical, deliberate, mindful, conscious process, cognitive process, which we call initially paroksha between that which is familiar and that which is unfamiliar. And we just use the logic, Elizabeth. Because I can make sense that there is distinctions in this world, there are distinctions in this body, it implies there must be a being who is ever present and unmodified. Let's ask that question again. How do we apply this practically? Someone else answer this. Knowing that you're the unchanging self in all situations that arise, all experience that arise. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. And in the presence of that unchanging, changes come to be known, come to be distinctly identified for what they are. And those changes are that one same reality, but modified apparently by Maya Striguna Shakti. Yes, it is a reminder. And there's a place for that. Because if we go back to verse 16, I just described, you know, that whole uh, Jiva Srishti. In that case, mm -hmm. it is not practical because that will be called escapism. And this is a common, unfortunate mistake. People use Advaita to escape. In this case, I will just put it aside. You apply at Atma anatma when? When everything is going well in your life. When you just have time to sit down and to inquire. It is a deliberate, uh, a conscious and isolated moment of inquiry. Now, hopefully, it is not just a one-off. It becomes your life. And this is why we have the process of karma yoga. So uh, we can introduce you know, the world to contribute to this one reality. And therefore, whatever you're contributing to Elizabeth reminds you of what? Satchit. The unmodified Satchit, which is apparently modified through Maya tri, uh, Maya's Triguna Shakti. Okay, so you're using the world to remind you of self-knowledge. That's how you get practical about this. So we ended verse 17 last week by stating the question, how do we strengthen this Atma Anatma Viveka? And the first method I gave you was through changing your language. 
because for such a long time, we've been used to associating the I to how we feel, to how we are and so on. So therefore, instead of saying, for example, I am feeling um, tired, you'd rather just say there is tiredness uh, in this body. Just that little distinction right there. Or you can also say the self that is looking through these eyes is the same self, the same reality looking through all of our eyes right now. One self, different experience. Why is the experience different? Because it is a different person there, different upadi, different superimposition. The second method by which we can strengthen this is objectifying anatma. In other words, putting everything in front and saying, okay, so this is an experience that is modified indeed. Uh, the third method is by identifying these five components. So in other words, you say, where is this happening? It's happening right now in one of these five. And therefore, that's called objectification. Another thing that we can do is we can, uh, as we will now see, we can come to see what is it in whose presence do all of these things happen. And Krishna is going to use a different model called the subject, the object, and knowledge, or the knower known and knowing. This is another model that Krishna will uh, tell us. And by knowing these three models, this model of the three constituents, we can also objectify that as anatma. And finally, the last method is we will go through six factors that the jiva needs to optimize, needs to uplift from tamasic and rajasic all the way to sattvic, such as willpower, what kind of willpower do you have? Is it rajasic willpower or tamasic willpower? What kind of knowledge or what kind of knowledge do you see the world with? Do you see it through tamasic knowledge? What kind of uh, door, what kind of attitude do you have? Is it tamasic attitude? Is it rajasic attitude? Is it sattvic attitude? So these six factors have to be uplifted to sattva guna. So that's what we will embark on. Jnanam nyeyam parijnata trividha karma chodana Karanam karma karteti, trividha karma sangrahaha. Knowledge, yanam, thought corresponding to an object, object of knowledge, yanam, and the knower, parinata, are the threefold cause of action. The doer, karta, the object, karma, and instrument, karnam, means of doing, are the threefold constituents of action. Thank you. So we have knowledge, object of knowledge, and knower, and then Krishna takes another route. It says doer, object, or instrument. So it's talking about one and the same thing, just different vocabulary. Um, now, before moving on to verse 18, in verse 1 to 17, so we're in verse 18 now, verse 1 to 17, what has Krishna done so far? He has summarized the entire Gita using only two sadhanas, only two possible sadhanas, which you can fit every other sadhana under. Karma yoga and jnana yoga. We often say, you know, there's bhakti yoga, there's upasana yoga. Okay. Ultimately, there's only karma yoga and there is jnana yoga. Karma yoga means anything that involves action, including upasana yoga, which we often attribute between chapter 7 to 12. So even upasana yoga being action will fall under ultimately karma yoga. Verse 18 to 40. Krishna will take another route at summarizing the entire Bhagavad Gita by answering six principles that are required for anyone's success, for the jiva's success, for the mind, to mind, to uh, work well, to be healthy, to have a healthy perspective, to think well, to uh, do the right thing. So this will be expounded, and each of these six topics will have three gradings of sattva, Tamaguna and Rajaguna. Now going back to verse 18. So the question is, what prompts the jiva into action? Action. What kind of action? It could be uh, speech, it could be uh, thoughts, and it could be um, any form of physical movement. So this, these three is classified as that which we can do as an action. So whenever we act, what happens? Why do we act in the first place for revision? We act because we want to get, gain a positive, enjoyable result. Therefore, I act because I want to enjoy. Now, when the enjoyment happens, it prompts the doer of the action to put another action into the field to re-enjoy again. And therefore, this reinforces the door. So let's put some order to this. Door. The individual, the karta, the door, the ahamkara, the sense of I, does an action, 
for the sake of enjoyment. When the enjoyment happens, the door will put another action to re-enjoy again. And this at the same time will reinforce the individual, the single individual. And therefore, the individual will slowly, slowly build their life that they have today. So you ask yourself, why do I have the life that I have? Because you have done actions in the past for, what's, for what? To suffer? No, to enjoy. And when you have done it again to enjoy, it slowly sculpted you the kind of person that you are today. In fact, the kind of actions that you do today are what? The kind of actions you've done before. And therefore, every single time, this makes the person who they are. You know, what do you paint? To kill time? No, you paint because you like to paint. You know, it makes you feel great. And therefore, when you see that great result, it makes you feel good. And you go, wow, I want another, you know, I want to feel good again. And therefore, you become a great painter after some time. I've just started to practice the piano. And I'm playing the, um, the Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, which is quite hard for a beginner. And finally got to tune both hands. I felt fantastic. Like, oh, man, I can hardly wait for this class to finish. I'll put the piano right in front. I will do it again. So this is how slowly, slowly the Jiva gets sculpted into some new character that they are. What comes first? Is it the doer or is it the enjoyer? Because why do you do to enjoy? So this means you must have already done before. So it seems like enjoyership came first. But can you really say that the enjoyership came first? Because the enjoyership to come first implies there must have been a doer who has done that in the first place. Therefore, we cannot trace the first. We cannot say, when was the first time at, cycle, at some cycle of creation, when there was a first jiva who put out an action and they sort of liked it. They played a twinkle, twinkle little star and suddenly they became some person who now is reborn to play the, play the game of life again. You cannot put the first. This is why questions like what came first, chicken or the egg, it's supposed to be a fascinating question. No, it is a question due to lack of knowledge. You cannot put a trace between whether it was the first doer in the universe or the first enjoyer. They were beginningless. And therefore, we have this world cycle after cycle with jivas yet created. Why? To enjoy, implying they have done it before. But if you ask the same question five cycles of creation ago, suppose a couple of trillions of years ago, it's going to be exactly the same answer. Therefore, step one, we cannot trace the beginning of the universe. What Krishna wants to pose in this verse is what specifically makes the jiva act? We stated, okay, action, enjoyership, therefore wants to do it again. But what specifically? And Krishna is going to provide three factors. The first is called jnanam. And this is the object, knowledge of the object, which has been perceived before. This is a cognitive process that happens in the mind. Why does it happen in the mind? Because you have seen the object before. For example, you've seen the chocolate before, have you not? Yes. Therefore, the moment I say Swiss chocolate, what's going to happen? You go, ah, I am familiar with that. And with that familiarity, that familiarity of that memory comes all of the samskaras, what the chocolate means, how tasty it is, whether I like it, whether I dislike it. Therefore, why do you have desires? Why do jivas have desires? In fact, we could rephrase these three and we say, what is the cause of all desires in the world? Because all jivas have desires, right? So, jiva, so Krishna is posing, what causes desire? What are the principles that cause desire? First is jnanam, knowledge of the object. So this means what? The more objects you have seen, the more desires you have. Now think about this, a little question. Suppose you were born 1,000 years ago. Would you have the desires that you have today? Like desires of the phone and desires of different apps and desires of coins on those apps and desires of dating and so on? No. Today, you got so much free information. Archive.org, all of the Upanishads are there. It's all out in the open. But what's the distraction? So many objects have come into from potential into manifest. And because there are so many options, the jiva has so many desires today, which the jiva didn't have 1,000 years ago. So which one would you have now? Would you rather go back 1,000 years ago where self-knowledge was very hard to find 
but you didn't have many desires at all. Or come back in this period of time and have so many desires owing to so many objects, but at the same time, knowledge is so much available. There are visuals, there are, there are all sorts of audios and YouTube and so many teachers. Which one would you have? No matter which one you answer, the point is there is never a perfect time for attaining moksha. This is what we call zero-sum game. If you go before, no desires, but self-knowledge is so hard to find. You have to travel right, to find it. Today, so easy to find, but hey, you've got so much opportunities and so many desires. Therefore, we can see how this world works. Zero-sum game. There is never a better or a worse time for attaining moksha. There is only one, though. Before the Vedas came, you had to wait. From the previous cycle of creation, those jivas had to wait to grow into you know, little ants and fish and then uh, apes and then monkeys and so on, all the way. And even when they became farmers and agriculturists and they could be in, you know, running around with some decent food, you still had to wait as a jiva for what? For a few jivas to start thinking about reality and start extracting those, those perceptions and writing them down. You had to wait for that, which means that what is the punishment if one doesn't attain moksha and the cycle of creation ends? Well, you get another chance, but you have to wait again. And then again, you have to wait for the rishis to start to receive the knowledge. And therefore you go, oh, okay, finally, the Vedas have been provided. Now I can attain moksha. So you can see how this process happens. Every single cycle of creation, a few individuals with clear minds owing to the past cycle of creation, that means sattvic minds, come to the point of perceiving reality and starting to, out of duty, write it down. Out of duty, teach it. And that duty transforms into what we have today, self-knowledge in the form of Vedas. So going back, first point that is required for desire to take place, knowledge of the object. Krishna calls this jnanam. The second is at nyayam. This is called the object. That means the physical object that has been perceived in this world because at some point it was in potential and now it is brought into manifest by whom? By the collective jiva desires. And those collective jiva desires slowly, slowly brought what we have, like the airplane and what we have, uh, machines and computers into the field. At some point, there was no need, but every cycle of creation, these new desires bring what? New objects, new, new nyayams into the present, which then becomes our jnanam, our internal knowledge, which we then have to deal with because it becomes part of who? Your desire as a jiva. So every cycle of creation, this happens. And finally, the third component for any desire, for any action to take place is parinyata, which is the subject. So we got knowledge, we got the object, and we got the subject, parinyata, in other words, called the ahamkara. And this refers to the ahamkara, who owns that experience of desire to one single individual. You say, I desire the bicycle. You don't desire the bicycle. I desire the bicycle. This is owing to the subject, the parinyata. And it's also um, important to understand, do not confuse the subject for the atma. Although you can say that it is, um, uh, you can say that it is atma, conditioned by, similarly conditioned by the ahamkara. In association with the ahamkara, we call that the subject. So we have, in short, the subject, object, and knowledge. We have the, or the knower, ahamkara, the known object, the nyayam, and the knowledge, the jnanam. So again, the uh, subject is not referring to uh, the aham to the uh, atma however it is referring to what we call the reflecting medium we can also call this reflecting medium why do we call it reflecting medium because the self as though shines on the reflecting medium and because it shines on it it illumines whatever objects are present in there and therefore the jiva not knowing the association says, I then desire. In other words, the subject starts to desire the objects, but it's only illumined by what? By self. In the presence of self, the objects get illumined, but not knowing the nature of self, 
For that reason, the person says, I desire the object, not knowing it is only because of me, because of my presence, that the object gets the chance to be desired in the first place. This is the consequence of avidya ignorance. Let's give you a little example how this happens in real life. Okay, so we've heard theory. Let's go into a little bit more uh, relatable. First step, object. Okay, so nyayam, uh, object. What kind of object? I don't know, maybe a pen. A, a new shiny Apple three pencil pen. I've got, okay, okay. nyayam, wow. Now it's become part of what? Knowledge, nyanam. Okay, now what happens then? Pravrti, nivrti. What is pravrti? According to either my samskaras or how I feel right now, I will feel attracted to this. This is called going towards. In psychology, we call this towards and away from. Pain and pleasure. So either after knowledge takes place, pravrti, I want it, or nivrti, I don't want it. I am repulsed by it according to two principles. One, samskara, that means your habits, your impressions, and two, your present state of mind. Once pravrti and nivrti have taken place, what's the next step? Action happens. What kind of action? I either do kaikam, I either think manasam, or either say vachikam. What does that do after the action takes place? Punya papa mixture. And what does that do? It sculpts the jiva's destiny. So let's go backwards. Current destiny, owing to the punya papam, owing to the action, owing to pravrti and nivrti, based on knowledge, which is a result of object. Let's go forward. Object, knowledge, nivrti, pravrti, action, punya papa, final desire expressed. Therefore, the person says, I want, I don't want. And therefore, their life is sculpted by that. Parinyata, nyayam, jnanam, chatrividha, karma chodana. In other words, the knower, the subject, the uh, the known, the object, and the knowledge. What is knowledge? The known object in the mind. These are the three fold that impel the jiva into action, that impel the jiva to do, to desire, to be compelled to go out there into the world and grab things for itself. And then Krishna wants to provide another perspective. And these three perspectives are, what are they called? Dur, karta. What is a dur? This is a desire-loaded jiva. What, what is the karta? It is the uh, atma seemingly conditioned by the ahamkara. The self seemingly conditioned by the instrument, the five layers instrument. And we call that the subject. Then we have the object, the karma. What is the object? This is the vyavaharika object which at some point was in potential, and now it is brought into manifest owing to the collective karma of all of the jivas. And therefore today, what kind of world do we live in? The world which at some point was not there because the desire for the objects, for the phone, for this, for that, was simply not there. And finally, we have the karanam. This is the body which is required for expressing one's desire into the world, into the Kurukshetra field, the field of action. And two, you need a mind to cognize the object in the field. And you need these three, in fact, the doer, that means the subject, you need the, uh, the object, and you need the instrument to do in this world and to get your desires. And all of these, once again, is a process called anatma. And why is this process there? for the sake of Jiva exhausting his or her karma. Yeah, I have a short question. Um, the knower is um, the mitya knower in this context, isn't it? Because there's also the satya knower. So in other words, the atma knower conditioned by the mitya knower. Okay, let's see what verse 19 says. So verse 19 will go into these six success factors which are required for moksha, as I explained before. Jnanam karma cha karta cha tridhaiva guna bhedataha prochate guna sankhyane yathava charnu tanyapi. In the Sankhya philosophy, knowledge, action, and doer are said to be threefold according to the distinction of the gunas. Listen to them also as they are. Krishna borrows from Sankhya philosophy 
The answer is because Advaita Vedanta does not reject anything that makes sense. Anything that makes sense, that has proper logic, proper reason, it is backed up from different angles, it will gladly borrow and it will present. And that is what's being presented now. And Krishna will present these six success factors, which are required to be assimilated, to be uplifted to sattva guna level in order for clarity to ensue, permanent clarity to ensue. Because what happens is sometimes the lights come on and off, you know, oh, now I get it. No, oh, now I lost it. Now I get it. Now I lost it. So how does one constantly get it? What is that permanent getting? Optimizing these six success factors into sattva guna. And what are they? One, vision. Now, vision is jnanam. In other words, what is a vision a product of? Knowledge. The kind of knowledge you have is the kind of vision you have of the world. If I have a good uh, knowledge, that means uh, accurate knowledge, then my vision will be accurate according to that knowledge. If my knowledge is sort of distorted, then how will you perceive the world? Through distorted vision. Suppose you perceive the world distorted, don't like the world. I mean, the knowledge is like that. You know, I, I, Others are out there to get me. What does that mean? No matter who comes to you, you will not like them. <laughs> Because no matter what happens, no matter what they do, they cannot please us. We're always skeptical. So if we correct our knowledge, then even the most, even, even those things that would otherwise agitate others, we find quite amusing. So this is the importance of proper knowledge. So again, going back, what is it that brings us pain? There's many causes. I already said jiva strishti. But another is inaccurate knowledge, rajasic knowledge, tamasic knowledge. The smile looking through, what is the cause? People I don't like, I'm agitated by small things, you know, noise is annoying me. Now, living like that every day, that is not a fun life. The person is not being, it's not going to be inquire, inquire, it's not going to be thinking about things. They're going to be thinking about how do I block the windows and, you know, silence my neighbors and, and so on. So, in other words, you need proper knowledge to make the person relax despite the obstacles in life. Second is attitude of the doer. Karta, what kind of attitude do we have? You know, is our attitude um, selfish? Is our attitude selfless? Karma, this is the nature of the undertaking. What kind of undertaking? What is the quality of your actions? Cooking the food. Is it just to kind of get it through, satisfy your wife and husband and just get it through and get a little checklist? Cooked, next. So the nature of the undertaking. Next is intellect. What kind of intellect do we have you know the intellect is our our savior all we have is our intellect but how do we optimize our intellect to be more sattvic fortitude this is driktihi fortitude or commitment is our commitment only as as good as things are interesting the moment something is not interesting we lose our commitment so how quickly do we give up how much do we stay at some task until it is complete all the way when all of these factors come together, what happens? We experience happiness. But even happiness, being the sixth factor, is also subject to trigunas. Do I get happy by seeing other people suffering? This is called tamaguna happiness. Or do I get happy by seeing your progress? This is called satvaguna happiness. So even how is one happy? Even that has to be questioned. Are there some distortions there? Is it perverted happiness? And so on. So let's go into threefold knowledge, threefold vision, threefold knowledge, which produces a vision of life. And this will be between verse 20 to 22. So just a little introduction. What Krishna is going to do is he's going to introduce us to three kinds of knowledge. And I'll give you a summary now. The first is tamasic knowledge. I see myself as the body. I'm only this gross physical body. That means that's the kind of knowledge that I have. This is called Chavarka. I only perceive, and that's all that exists in the world through the five senses. That is it. After death, what do these people say? That is the end of me. So you can now think, what happens? What is the relationship to following the rules? It is very small because there's no consequences. Therefore, these people are very hard to control. And they're just like wild out there. Because after I die, we all go to the same nothingness. Rajasic knowledge, this is when I identify myself as the mind. 
Therefore, I am immortal because the mind continues. So you ask these people, what do you think about death? Oh, I'm not afraid. But then you question, why are you not afraid? And then will, if you investigate, because I know that I will continue as the mind. Therefore, ignorance is still revealed there. It's still there. They will say things like parents are only mind in reference to the body, but I am the mind. So it seems quite sophisticated, isn't it? Like I am the mind, you know, parents are just parents relative to this person, but they're not really my parents. And I continue in life. I'm immortal. It's like, wow, this person is speaking high, but still in reference to the mind. And finally, sattvic knowledge. This means when one comes to Vedanta, one understands I am neither the body nor the mind, nor the traveling mind, nor the temporary body. In other words, they are, um, I don't have any punya papam whatsoever. Now, verse 20, let's talk about sattvic knowledge. Sarva bhute shuye naikam bhavam avyayam ikshate avibhaktam vibhakte shu tadnyanam vidhi sattvikam. No sattvic knowledge to be that by which one sees the non-dual, imperishable and undivided, self in all divided beings. So Krishna here is relating to self-knowledge. So the highest sattvic knowledge of all is self-knowledge. And he says, Avibhaktam vibhakte shutatnyanam vidhi. So right vision or right knowledge, or sattvic knowledge, what is it? It is to see unity in diversity, the interconnectedness in the apparent divisions. It is to see the whole, it is a holistic vision that sees the role in different parts, sees all parts in the world and sees where each thing and how each thing has a role connected to something else. You see a bird, it's not just a bird. There's so much there. The bird eats, it keeps the ecosystem alive, keeps the animal world alive. The insects do their job. The bees do their job. The interconnectedness of all beings. In other words, it keeps the big picture present. The big picture never escape. And what are some examples of sattvic knowledge? You could say things like, to have a, a decent life, what do I have? I need to have balance, the middle way, nothing extreme. I need to have a successful career. I need to have a successful, uh, some friends, uh, some health. I need to have spiritual knowledge. In other words, you're thinking holistically. You're seeing how career is connected to spirituality. But with, what are we seeing spirituality? No, money and spirituality are two different things. But these individuals see the interconnectedness. I need all to live a healthy, balanced life. They will not cheat another person. Why not? Because they will see that if I cheat you, then you will not trust someone else in the future who can really help you. You see how the mind's going already ahead? It's not making about itself. This is sattvic knowledge. It's thinking about the whole. They will encourage others to go first. Because often we say, no, let's others go first and I'll follow them. No, you go first because by you going first, you will give others the motivation to also shine their loveliness fragrance into the world you go first the one intelligence that is sustaining this body is the same intelligence that is sustaining your body is sustaining all bodies one intelligence ishwara again the person is holding the big picture what is going on right now how many things are going on right now the earth the orbit the sun what's happening on the other side of the world all of this is there present you think about all of the innovations, you know, aviation, medicine. How many of us do have medicine once in a while? Okay, we, we have penicillin, we have Panadol, but who created that? 1936, I believe, the greatest invention was antibiotics. How many lives has that saved? This is what you think about because you see the role in, in, in diversity. You see how every part is here now helping us to sustain our lives. So what are all of these have in common? Sattva guna knowledge. What are all these have in common? You're thinking the interconnectedness of all. You're thinking the big picture. You're thinking commonalities rather than differences. You're thinking friends or unity rather than enemies. You're seeing the sameness rather than differences. In conversations, what can I relate with you? 
what do I see in you that I can talk with you and we can relate in the same page versus who are you? What are you doing? No, no, I don't think that's wrong. What else are you doing? This difference, this difference attitude. So sattvic knowledge brings your knowledge, brings your vision with commonalities. What do I relate with you? So sattvic knowledge is Brahma Vidya, by whose means one recognizes that the self shining these thoughts, emotions, and sensations, illumining these thoughts, emotions, and sensations is the very same self illumining the thoughts, emotions, and sensations of all bodies in the entire universe. One self that you are. This is what sattvic knowledge recognizes. And this is why I say there's always that one common thread through and through all differences, apparent differences. If we put this into another way, what the verse is saying is there's only one field of existence whose nature is self-conscious. And in that field of existence, when a body gets born, that body gets illumined by what? Existence, awareness, you, and therefore that body becomes conscious. Therefore, one existence, which is self-conscious, in the presence of it, a body grows Having a subtle body, which is capable of reflecting that existence awareness, it is able to become self-conscious and say, I am, I exist, I am aware, because of this one existence awareness. Paramartananda uses a lovely example, and we say, well, how do you prove this existence awareness is everywhere? Because it's very easy to see it in you know, a body, you know, it's the body's alive, and it's like speaking, and it's dynamic. And now we use the example of light and fingers, and we say, well, you can see the light. Why? Because it's bouncing on a reflecting medium, is it not? And you say, well, now suppose I put a black surface here. You say, well, where's the light behind? You say, well, it's not there. Well, it is there because the moment I bring a reflecting medium there, you still see the light. Yes, you see my finger, but you only see my finger. Why? Because the one light is still there and was there all along. Therefore, it is ready to illumine. So this is why I say when the body gets born, immediately becomes self-aware about its conditions, about its sensations, about its emotions. Why? Because the awareness, the field of awareness was already waiting to illumine that reflecting medium. Therefore, the person says, I am, I am conscious. And there's another example uh, where we say that this field of awareness is like space. And space is a lovely comparison because space is what? attributeless. In reference to mitya, it is still an attribute. It's still a, a, a gross element. It is still space. But suppose space is the final reality. We say, what is space? Does space have any attributes? Does space have any, any attributes? No, it doesn't. Does space have sound attribute? No, it doesn't. Because if space had a sound attribute, then you could not make out individual sounds. They would be blurred out by the sound of space. It would be like this. Suppose the attribute of sound was the, and I talk, the, you couldn't hear anything. Or suppose it was not so loud, it would be T plus the talking. And the moment I stop talking, it would be like T, but what happens when there's no sound? It goes back to silence. And this silence is representative of that which has no attributes by default. In other words, why is it that distinct sounds come into space? Why is it that a whisper can come into space? And when a whisper is finished, there's no more whisper. It's ready for some new sound to come. Why is that? Because space by nature is attributeless. In that same way, this field of existence is attributeless, and therefore, whatever comes into the field, whatever pops into manifestation, gets distinctly identified as just that, including space. That's why we say, I know about space, I'm postulating about space, which implies you must be other than space. I am like space, we say in Vedanta. I am space-like attributeless like because i'm attributeless like all other attributes come into manifestation okay i want to draw a little diagram and we will end with that um just to give you some visuals so we'll draw a, um, a circle 
and we'll call this the field, field of existence, which is self-conscious. This is all static knowledge, by the way. Don't put a little sun there. I need two Jivas, please. No worries, nothing's going to happen to you. Who would like to contribute? Okay, David and Jiva too. I need a female Jiva. Okay, Rani. Okay, so call this Jiva one. We'll call this Jiva two. Entire body is pervaded by the subtle body, the physical body, the gross body, pervaded by the subtle body. But I'm just going to say, suppose the subtle body is there. So let's just amplify what that looks like. So we're targeting David now. Okay, so we'll just suppose this is the amplification of the subtle body, and we'll call this the parinata, parinata, or we'll call this the uh, hamkara, or even call it the buddhi, or we even call it the reflecting medium. And then we'll create a tree. Okay, and chapter seven, apara prakriti. Chapter 13, call this um, Kshetra, that means the field, matter. And in chapter 14, call this three gunas. This tree gets represented in the mind. And we said earlier that this tree in the mind gets further sculpted by some skaras and two present state of mind. What is it that a jnani knows? What is it that a liberated person knows? Let's explore that. We're exploring now sattvic knowledge. This is why I'm writing this down. So it's relative to the verse. The jnani understands, jnani knows that which illumines, knows that which illumines the contents of the mind. So we'll say contents brown. What are we talking about? this that which illumines the contents of this mind is what is because of existence awareness because of existence awareness self kevalam atmanam and this very self that illumines the contents of david's mind is the same self which illumines the contents of rani's mind over there so this entire self pervades that's why we call it the field of existence whose nature is self-conscious. In other words, whatever comes into this field of existence, which is self-conscious, it itself becomes self-conscious, assuming it's a jiva that's able to be self-conscious. An ant doesn't have that. A dog doesn't have self-consciousness, but there is still consciousness that's making that intelligence work. Therefore, the ant or the dog does what it does. The next question is, how does knowledge of objects, how does nyayam, this is called nyayam, according to the previous verse, how does nyayam occur in the mind? How does knowledge of objects take place to the self? Because remember, the self has no power to know, has no power to know unless it is associated to the buddhi, to the reflecting medium. So the question is, how does the self come to know? How do you how do you come to know about this world, about this class right now, if you are not the doer, enjoyer, or the sufferer? Well, firstly, you, I'm talking about the field of existence, need to be associated to the jiva right now in order for this experience to occur. So there's two models to explain this. The first is self, you, shines on all objects of this world and reflects back to the parinata. That means you're shining on all objects in this world right now. And it's reflecting back to whom? The jiva that's being worn right now. The one that's listening to this right now goes, oh, I am listening. Why are you saying that? Because you, the field of existence, are illumining this screen that you're looking at right now. And this screen is reflected back to the mind which you are pervading this very second. Therefore, you say, ah, this experience is going on right now. That's the first model. Or you can, so that's model number one. Or model number two, it's the same thing. You can say existence awareness. I, right now, the field of existence that's illumining all minds in this entire universe, am 
shining on this reflecting medium. Which reflecting medium? The one that's being worn right now, the Jiva, the David Jiva, the Rani Jiva. I am shining on this reflecting medium right now. And this reflecting medium being illumined or being blessed by me, by existence awareness, I am able to, owing to the five gates being open, to the five organs of perception being open, I am able to, in return, shine and illumine the objects of the world. So right now, one field of existence, which is self-conscious, which you are this very second, are shining on your mind right now because your mind is blessed by you, existence awareness, and because the eyes of the jiva are open, it's able to shine into the world and therefore other objects in this world get illumined. And this messy map model is an example of Brahma Vidya knowledge, what Krishna is talking about. Yes, is this the same experience with blind people because they don't have a vision of what a tree looks like or what an object looks like? Yeah, they still know what nothing looks like, nothing yeah. of an object of knowledge. So what is the experience they go through with, with what we, we are talking about, awareness and consciousness? They go through an experience of nothing because what's the difference between blackness and color? It's still an object of knowledge that comes to awareness in the presence of I. In other words, you take out senses, Rani, there's what? There's no senses, but that is still an object of knowledge. There's nothing to report. But the point is, in the presence of I, there is nothing to report. So even nothing is an object of knowledge. But they have the other senses, which is sharpened, uh, not just the eyesight. They have the sense of smell, touch, and everything else. Yeah. And hearing. So there is a sense of, of something in their mind, isn't it? Yeah, so that uh, sharpness is relative to the mind's uh, capacity of being refined, being, uh, you know, being just sharp, but it's still a known object. It's still, it's still something that comes in the presence of knowledge. It's still an object of knowledge in the presence of self. So it doesn't matter whether it's dull or sharp, it is still what? Anatma. No, just think on the words of, on the, on the words of the samskaras, uh, previous past experience and past knowledge yeah like, you know we automatically when we as a child is growing up you know what a tree is what you know what things are yeah so obviously through the samskaras yeah yeah but see it doesn't matter i mean you can still know what sounds so you're just talking about one little you know section of reality which is called form and color and shape but there's still sounds to report so for them it's still the same concept but they're just not occupied with forms for example you go and see a really beautiful hanuman statue and now it just stays in your mind and you kind of obsessed over it but the person who is blind doesn't have that privilege but they will have the privilege of for example being more sensitive to sounds therefore they will keep sounds in their mind to contemplate upon thank you so yes felix yes another short question um, but this mind I'm illumining is then also known to me as Satyam, isn't it? It is known to you because you, existence awareness, are shining on you, existence awareness, modified by Maya Striguna Shakti. And because of that, there is knowledge to you, yes. itself, in association with the Felix. So finally, what is the nature of this field of existence which is by the nature of self-aware, self-conscious. It is non-verbalized. It is non-participating. It is non-interfering principle of knowledge in whose presence objects come to knowledge because of self. Therefore, when we say I am, that is only a manifest form of something that doesn't need to be verbalized. You don't need to say I am to know that you are. That's why we say, what is the nature of Kevalam Atmanam, the self? It is non-interfering, non-verbalized, non-participating principle of knowledge in whose presence the knowledge of Anatma comes to be known. Keeping in mind that even Anatma is also Atma modified through Maya's Triguna Shakti. And this summarizes verse 20, which is sattvic knowledge. Next week, we will investigate rajasic knowledge and 
tamasic knowledge. Sarve bhavantu sukhinaha, sarve santu niramayaha, sarve bhadrani pashyantu ma kashchittu kabhag bhavet. Om Shanti 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 Thank you.